Reading from Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion upon them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. And then on in chapter 10. He called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. This is the word of the Lord. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion upon them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. I want to look first at the Saviour's compassion. It says that the, the, the thing that says that Jesus was moved with compassion is the, uh, is the deepest sort of Greek term for moved with compassion. It means in effect that Jesus was moved deeply to the very depths of his being. And so I, I wonder, I'd just like to point out three different ways that Jesus showed compassion to us. Firstly, he, he was moved to compassion by the world's sorrow, by people's sorrow. Uh, there's a story in the Gospel of Jesus walking past uh, the widow of Nain and she's following her son uh, who's being buried. He's died. And so he's moved to his heart and he's filled with a desire to help her. And so he does. He brings her son back to life. Jesus was filled with the desire to wipe a tear from every eye. Secondly, Jesus was moved by people's hunger. The sight of a hungry crowd was a call on his power to do something about it. Much of Christian work centres on feeding the hungry. All over the world, Christians and non-Christians are involved in feeding the hungry. You too can be part of it just by sharing a meal with a friend, sharing your meal with the neighbours, sharing the food, your sandwiches that you have with the person sitting next to you. Jesus was moved to compassion by people's hunger. And as his followers, we too should be moved by compassion for people's hunger. Thirdly, he was moved by the world's bewilderment. People are longing for God. The Orthodox religion had nothing to offer. Worship and teaching should give us a fresh strength for the day or the week ahead, not actually baffle us with irrelevant facts or tiresome commands to keep in order to somehow please God. Faith should be a support and not a handicap. People today, people at this time, are, I guess, many of us are bewildered by what is going on in our world. And I believe that Jesus is moved by compassion. And our Christian faith should exist to lift people to heaven, not weigh them down with fresh burdens. Truly, faith in Jesus, to coin a but a particular popular advert at this time. Faith in Jesus should give us wings. So my point, first point is, is Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the plight of human being. He was moved when he saw people suffering. He was moved when he saw people's hunger. He was moved when he saw people's bewilderment. Jesus is mo moved by what you're going through. And Jesus calls us as his followers to be moved and to respond to the difficult things that people are going through today. God bless you.
Okay, secondly, I would like to look at the size of the harvest. So we've looked at the Saviour's compassion, now the size of the harvest. When he saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion on them. They were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send labourers into his harvest. The religious people of Jesus' day look forward to the time when the godless would be destroyed. Contrast that to Jesus. Uh, I mean, they just completely and utterly struggle to understand him. Uh, Because Jesus came to seek out and save that was lost. He went looking for the sinner. He went and told them that they mattered to God, that God cared about them. So rather than destroying the sinners, Jesus came uh, to seek them, to find them and ultimately to die for them. And Jesus now sends out his followers into the harvest to share that work. Because the harvest will never be reaped unless there are people to reap it. Jesus still wants men and women to hear the good news. But he needs people to share it. There are people that you shop with uh, and you learn alongside. There are people that you work with. There are people who you, you sit in taxis with. Who will never hear the gospel of Jesus unless you tell them then they're never going to come and come across any of the the sort of the great evangelists of the 20th 21st century so the only evangelists they will ever meet are you and me martin luther um was a a, a sort of a, a priest and he uh, he had a friend when he was a, a young priest who said you go out into the world and i'll stay behind and pray for you And so the friend, who was also a monk, uh, would spend his time praying that God would bless the work of Martin Luther in spreading the good news. And he had a dream one night in which uh, he could see a a harvest, uh, crops that went for miles and miles, fields upon fields. And there was a solitary man working there with a sickle, taking in the crop. Uh, And he felt so sad. And then the man turned and faced him and he realised that it was Martin Luther. And so he said himself, I'm going to have to leave behind my prayers. It's not that he has stopped praying, but I must, if the harvest is going, is ever going to be reaped, then I too must do my share. If God has a message to you as a follower of Jesus this morning, it would be the harvest will not be reaped unless I too do my share. Millions of people still do not know that Jesus died to give them a new beginning, a new life on earth, and victory over sin and hell and death. Will you share what God has done for you? Uh, Recently, I I kind of left, I've left a few reviews on eBay uh, and uh, of things I've bought. And my responsibility is, is to say about my experience. My responsibility is to share my experience. So I say, yeah, this was good. This uh, this salespeople, these people were very good. They delivered on time. The products was good, etc. That's my responsibility. My responsibility is to share my review. Uh, It's not my responsibility on other people's response to it. There are many people I've told about Jesus who at this time have not yet given their lives to Jesus. But that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is I've shared that for me, the best thing about my life is Jesus. For me, uh, my life, I, I felt before Jesus was kind of black and white. And since Jesus is kind of like super technicolor. So I share that whenever I get the chance. But it's not my job to force people to become Christians. You know, they, 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 they are, we're all free will. God does not force himself upon people. Jesus has an offer of new life. And, uh, and, and we, as followers of Jesus, are partakers in this new life. And that's great. But we're not called just to hog it for ourselves. We're called to let people know that Jesus has changed our life, that Jesus has made a difference. So there is a sizable harvest out there, particularly at the moment. I think uh, Jesus will again look at the world and see people bewildered and perplexed, especially by recent events. 
and he would say that there is a great harvest and he calls us to be part of sharing in that good harvest. Will you share? Will you share what God has done for you? And then we move on to the third part. The selection of the team. And he called to him his twelve disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So we have looked at the Saviour's compassion. We've looked at the size of the harvest. And now we're going to look at the selection of the team. And the first thing I want to point out about this team is that they were just ordinary guys. There's no one here with a special social advantage or special gifts. There's no superstars or celebrities. Jesus is looking for ordinary people with no academic or social background. He's looking for people who can do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Jesus chooses us not for what we've become, but, but, but he chooses us because he can see what we can be. So, and I would, I would encourage you this morning to, to say to you that Jesus wants to use you. There is no one on this world that Jesus is not capable of transforming and that Jesus is not capable of using. There are many, many religious people at the time that Jesus could have selected, but he calls this ordinary bunch of fellows to follow him. And today he still calls very ordinary people to do extraordinary things. As Mother Teresa said, we cannot always do uh, great acts of devotion. We cannot always do great acts of love, but we can all do small acts with great love. So God is calling you and me to follow him this morning. So we've kind of got the idea that they're very ordinary men, that if you look at the disciples, if you look at the people who followed Jesus, they were very ordinary men and women. And God is still calling ordinary men and women to follow Jesus. But secondly, I want to point out that they were quite a strange mixture. Uh, my son's recently taken part in a sociological experiment where for two weeks he's got to wear a Liverpool kit all the time. And it's been quite painful because he's a Manchester United fan, uh, as am I. And uh, so he's had, he's had quite a rough time. And already he's been spat at, he's been sworn at, uh, he's been assaulted. I dread to think what it's going to be like when he leaves our house. Sorry, couldn't resist that one. But um, the, the disciples were a bit like that. We kind of often think of in our society of you know opposing football t teams. And I, I know a while ago uh, I was challenging people at our church uh, to see it could they wear the football shirt of the team they most dislike. Uh, one of uh, the church that I want to work at is in Burnley, and uh, a number of the people there felt that they couldn't possibly bring themselves to go around in a Blackburn shirt. So we kind of struggle with that. But if you look at the disciples of Jesus, you see quite, you see opposites, absolute opposites. You see all sorts of different people. Often in society, we're kind of grouped together by birds of a feather. But as followers of Jesus, we're really quite differing people. And uh, if we look at the mixture, Matthew, for instance, Matthew was a tax collector. As a tax collector, at that time, he was working for the Romans. Pretty much ordinary people would have considered him a quizzling and a traitor. Uh, and so just, just about everybody would have hated him. But also in that group of disciples, there's Simon the Zealot. Simon, again, I guess in some respects, Simon was like the French resistance. He was, you know, he was absolutely committed to, to, to getting the enemy out of the country. So Matthew, the tax collector, 
normally would not be the kind of person that Simon would hang around with. Matter of fact, Simon could well have been sent to stick a knife in between the shoulder blades of someone like Matthew. And yet Jesus calls these quite unlikely and different people to follow him. He calls fishermen, he calls all sorts of unusual people. He calls young, he calls old, he calls rich, he calls poor. And today, look around and see the people, um, or if maybe you have to mentally think of the people who are normally in church alongside you. And we're all quite a different bunch. There's all sorts of ages, all sorts of backgrounds, different educational levels, different wealth levels. None of it matters. What we have in common is that we are called to follow Jesus. Men who hate each other can learn to love each other when they fall in love with Jesus. Sadly, religion in our world sometimes divides people. In Jesus, faith is a means for drawing people together as brothers and sisters. In conclusion... If you want to make a difference in the world, then I can think of no higher thing than A, to follow Jesus, and B, to serve him. Uh, you, we're talking about making the kind of difference that can last eternity, for eternally. We see that Jesus is compassionate for people around. The Saviour has compassion. We see that there's a sizable harvest. We see that God calls ordinary and distinct people to follow him. And this morning, God is calling you and saying, what about you? Will you too become, come and follow me and share in the work of transforming our world? Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of new life. We thank you that you were willing to die in our place. We pray, Lord God, that you would open our eyes to our blindness and that we may know you and love you and that through us you may share your light and your love with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.